Walter Willett at Harvard has the Nurses' Health Study and the Health Professional Follow-Up Study. What do these studies say and why are they so convincing? It's, so f first of all, I'd like to spend a moment congratulating them, you know, Walter Willett, Frank Hugh, uh, Dr. Song, everyone who has been working in that area. They've provided a massive amount of data. They are heavily criticized by the other side. You wouldn't imagine that there would be another side, but there is another side um, who doesn't believe that uh, nutrition questionnaires can be used for fruitful science. Their criticisms are that you're going to get some random responses, people who just don't fill them out carefully, people who don't have good recall, 24-hour recall of what they've eaten or what their patterns are, uh, or they're just no good at uh, understanding, you know, what kind of food they're actually eating and they're putting, you know, random responses. And I have a few criticisms of those criticisms. Number one is that they're doctors and nurses. If they've, they've been to school, they are medical trained, even though they may not be nutrition experts, they know the difference between a steak and a vegetable, I mean, for example, all right? The other one is just a scientific or statistical principle of entropy. What in the world am I talking about entropy? Well, that's the third law of, of thermodynamics, that things tend to disorder, okay? That is, in, you, act to, you have to actively expend energy to get something to be organized. So how does that apply here? Suppose you're doing food frequency questionnaires, okay, and there's random responses. How could those somehow coagulate to give you solid information that reaches statistical significance uh, rather than suppressing some finding? Well, fact is that they do reach statistical significance on several major findings. So quoting mostly from the Song article uh, published in the um, Journal of the American Medical Association uh, a couple years ago, where they found that substituting vegetable protein for, for animal protein would decrease mortality, uh, cardiovascular, uh, cancer, other, total mortality, and that the type of animal protein that you're substituting the vegetables for actually mattered. The biggest highlights would be that if you got rid of uh, processed meat, you would decrease cancer. If you got rid of eggs, you would decrease cancer mortality. If, you, if the biggest correlate with cardiovascular mortality was the uh, processed red meat. And that data is so strong that if you look at overall mortality um, or, or heart disease, for example, it appears that you could cut the, the heart attack rate. And it's hard to imagine a vegan person saying this out loud, but you could cut the heart attack rate in the United States maybe 25 percent if you got everyone who's eating processed meat to, own, to eat red meat instead. <laughs> okay. And so very powerful data, and maybe we shouldn't be extrapolating from it, but, um, and probably you know, the one legitimate concern about the, uh, the levels of difference that you're seeing is that these were doctors and nurses who had at least one cardiovascular risk factor. There may actually be people, you know, whose risk is so low that they could eat whatever, whatever they want and not get heart disease. And then there are people on the other side who, you know, if they don't stick to plant-based nutrition, they'll have a heart attack in their early 40s. Well, um, for most people with a cardiovascular risk factor, they need to pay attention to the nurse's health study and health professional follow-up where they indicate exactly um, uh, what will happen to you if you don't substitute um, all of your animals for vegetables. Um, there's more insight than that from that, that came from their group. Probably one of the uh, best studies that I've seen would, would be the uh, uh, one in the Journal of American Medical Association that looked specifically at the levels of things that, that nutritionally end up correlating with death. Okay? And uh, can people eat some red meat and avoid the increment in death? 
Uh, according to their data, point, apparently you could. Now, it um, doesn't say about how well you do in terms of hypertension and the, and the like, um, but uh, anything over 14 grams, now that's a tiny little piece of uh, an animal product, r would result in, in death uh, or more death. Um, that's unprocessed. If it was processed meat, uh, and it's interesting the manuscripts that high processed meat, well, it turns out that the definition of high was any, <laughs> okay? Uh, the other one that had any was uh, uh, sugar-sweetened beverages, okay? Uh, people should not be eating them at all. Sodium, more than 2,000 milligrams, eating saturated fat, all of them ended up increasing uh, mortality. Not having enough uh, nuts, not enough vegetables, enough fruits, increasing mortality. So we've, um, it's interesting that they're so creative um, in terms of, of how to collect the data. And once they collect it, uh, very rigorous scientifically in analyzing it. And you could say that because it's prospective, meaning you start from the beginning, then measure what happens down the road. Non-randomized, which means that you're not telling people what to do. You're just observing, so it's observational, not random, randomized. That it can only be considered descriptive. It's describing something, not prescriptive. That is, you shouldn't change your behavior based on this. Well, I think that might be a little harsh. I'm not gonna see their data, see the nurses and doctors die if they're eating processed meat, and then go eat it. I'm just not gonna do that. And, I can, and there are people who choose to say that that's a criticism. Um, and that criticism, the only way to deal with it is prospective randomized trials. And hopefully we will get to that point where we have that kind of level of evidence, but until then, large scale, large cohorts, carefully done uh, with uh, long-term outcomes is pretty much where we are.